This is Duke University. I came over to, uh, when I became chair of the Department of Evolutionary Anthropology a few years ago, a couple years ago, the Global Health Initiative Institute was, was, was sort of starting up, and, and I thought, we have something to offer those, those guys. We, we really know something that, that I think would be helpful to them, and I know that they have a lot that they could offer us. And, and I wanted to form this interaction um, between the two departments. So that's sort of something about what this talk is about. I'm kind of selling something here. I'm sort of selling evolutionary anthropology, and I'm selling an evolutionary perspective on health and health issues. And, and I actually uh, probably messed up by, by having the word human health, because really today we're only going to be talking about skeletal health, but that's a, an aspect of skeletal health. Obviously, sort of the standard thing we think of when we think of evolutionary anthropology is understanding human evolution and our fossils. Here's a fossil you're going to be seeing a lot of today, one of our earliest ancestors from about three million years ago, and some stone tools and a little reconstruction of that face. So obviously, one of the primary jobs of uh, evolutionary anthropologists is to go out into the desert. This is uh, James B. Duke Professor Elwin Simons digging fossils out of the ground. There's a little fossil there, and reconstructing them. Basically reconstructing the pathways of evolution. So I also want to argue that um, evolutionary anthropologists serve as a doorway for those of you who are interested in involvement in other countries, as a doorway to those countries and as a connection between the people that are there and, and, uh, and Duke. When, for example, we're talking with Duke Engage about taking kids to Cameroon and having them involved in studies of the bushmeat trade and the protein that's brought in by eating, eating primates in, in Africa and so on and so forth, and, and what, what kind of replacements are needed if we take out that trade. This is a Neanderthal from, say, between 50 and 70,000 years ago or so. And you can see that this, this individual has um, deep dental abscesses, and there's actually some loss of tooth and some bone regrowth there. The bones are bent with rickets. The joints are riddled with arthritis and bent in this way. And, and there's arthritis, you can see little lips of arthritis along the vertebral bodies. So the problem of bone and joint health is a very deep one, deep in our past. Now, it's not as deep, we, we were talking this little uh, conversation we had um, before this talk as to when we see the first signs of skeletal disease and pathology, and I would argue that this is one of the clearest signs, and we probably have some as as far back as 500,000 years ago. So that what we're interested in really is parsing out the mechanical effects of obesity, being heavier and carrying more load, and the inflammatory effects of being obese and having um, hypertrophied and necrotic fat cells, as well as a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines running around through the body. So we're interested in trying to parse these effects out and my side of the things is um, joint stress. And in this, in this uh, overly fancy drawing here, we're looking at joint pain, destruction, and disability, and the influence of behavioral patterns, such as decreased pain control and, and negative thinking, whether that makes you more disabled, leading to more joint destruction. We're looking at inflammatory patterns, cytokines, and how they are both predictors of joint pain and destruction and are contributing to this process. And then we're looking at my side of things, weight and joint stress as it relates to uh, joint pain and destruction and disability, as well as these cognitive behavioral factors. So we're trying to understand what's going on with all of this. And there's no question that obesity is a leading it leads to lower walking speeds, it leads to changes in gait, it leads to more disability, and probably leads to greater arthritis. But it really is hard to know entirely about how this kind of obesity relationship, this mass relationship, plays into things if we actually don't understand how joints are designed. This is where the comparative approach comes in. I now have two kinds of bipeds. I have the human kind, oops, the human kind, I was putting the wrong thing, and 
the one previously, the early hominid kind here. So now I can start to think about what, what is the essence of these differences. So when chimpanzees, pictured here, walk compared to a human being, they walk, as I mentioned, with a bent hip and knee gait. Human gait is a deeply labile behavior. None of us walk exactly alike. In fact, uh, Office of Homeland Security thinks that they can videotape us all and identify us walking into airports and so on and so forth and tell which one of us is a terrorist and which one of us isn't. We have distinct gates. There is the potential that we've revealed by studying our ape, ans our ape relatives and our human ancestors protective mechanisms for gait that should follow a pattern of stress reduction. So people who are feeling real loading at their joint, who are trying to reduce that loading, are going to adopt gait patterns that are more similar to our ancestors than ours. When we understand these things, we can start to ask the question, how are we going to treat people? How are we going to redesign their, their walking environment? How are we going to retrain them in walking that gives them some of the best of all these possible worlds? Thank you.